This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's Word, let's go to the Lord and ask His guidance and direction on our time together this morning. Father, we pray that as we study Your Word today that we might be able to concentrate and focus on the information that is given, but it is not given just for information's sake, but it is given to drive us forward in our spiritual life that we may come to a greater understanding of, of who You are, of Your policies and procedures in human history and our lives as those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is also a challenge to those who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ as to the real essence of salvation, which is faith alone in Christ alone, that salvation is a free gift given on the basis of who you are and what Christ did on the cross and does not require anything on our part. Now, Father, we pray that as we study today that the Holy Spirit would make clear the things that we need to learn and apply. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we are back in our study in 2 Kings. We are in 2 Kings chapter 5, and this is one of those great chapters in the Old Testament that teaches us about the grace of God. Of all the doctrines that people can get confused about in the Scriptures, grace is one of the Uh, highest in that list, one of the most common uh, areas of confusion. People somehow think that grace is something that is earned. Some people think grace is something that is infused. Some people think that grace is something that is acquired incrementally as one goes through certain steps or phases of, of worship. There's all manner of ideas about what grace is, and all they do is just muddy, muddy things up. Grace is a very simple concept. It means that something is given free of charge. It, is, it has no strings attached. There are no conditions. It is a simple uh, gift that is given solely on the basis of the character of the one who is giving, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the uh, character of the person who is being given the gift. It doesn't have anything to do with their position in life. It doesn't have anything to do with their talents, their abilities, uh, their accomplishments. It is based uh, exclusively on the one who is doing the giving. Uh, and God's grace is given freely to everyone in the human race. And it's always been that way throughout the both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And even though the focus of the Old Testament is upon Israel and God's plan and purposes for Israel, we know that throughout the Old Testament there is also an emphasis on God's grace to the Gentiles. It is not uh, covered in every chapter, but we can think of God's grace to numerous Gentiles from Adam until the call of Abraham. All were Gentiles, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then even after God calling of Abraham and narrowing his plans and purposes in human history to the descendants of of Abraham, God still had uh, extended his grace to Gentiles. And the two great examples of God's missionary work among the Gentiles in the Old Testament are Jonah being sent to the Assyrians about a hundred years or so 
uh, after the time uh, that we're studying right now in 2 Kings chapter 5, and the episode that's covered in 2 Kings chapter 5, the uh, healing of Naaman's leprosy. Naaman is a Syrian. He is a Gentile. He is not a Jew. And so uh, we see an example here, though, of how the Abrahamic covenant is being uh, is being fulfilled in terms of his salvation in the Old Testament, that the descendants of Abraham are being a blessing to others. In the Abrahamic covenant, God made a promise to Abraham that he would give him land, he would give him uh, a seed, he would give him descendants that would be uh, more numerous than the stars of the sky, the sands of the uh, seashores. And he also told Abraham that he would be a blessing to all people. It was expressed in an imperative. He was to be a blessing to all people. And so Israel was to bless, be a blessing to all peoples on the earth because they were the source of the gospel in the Old Testament. And so we see this in the uh, fifth chapter of Second Kings, and it fits the theme that we have seen in the last three chapters that is a major element in the ministry of Elisha, and that is the grace of God, how God is the one who gives life where there is death. God is the one who restores uh, that which has been taken away. God is the one whose grace is sufficient. He is the one who provides uh, when there is nothing there. And, of course, the context, the historical context of of the episodes here are during a time of tremendous apostasy in the northern kingdom. And so there are going to be certain parallels and certain applications that we can take uh, from these chapters, from these incidents that apply to us because we are living in a time when Western civilization as a whole, in the United States more specifically, are in a time of great apostasy, a time of tremendous uh, paganism, and yet There are tremendous things that are going on, even in the midst of all of the uh, negatives that we hear about. God is still working. He's still on his throne. People are being saved. The gospel is going out through a number of missionaries, a large number of missionaries still throughout the whole world. And this is still a nation that supports uh, Israel. And so for all of these reasons, God is still... Uh, providing for us and providing for this nation because he has a long-term plan. It doesn't have anything to do with who we are as a nation, uh, the number of believers that are here in this nation. It has to do with God's, uh, God's plan. The same thing was true in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom had a minority of believers, and it was a time of great apostasy when they the leaders were following after the fertility cults of uh, the Baals and the Asherah. And it's a time of tremendous uh, slavery, uh, political tyranny and oppression and spiritual tyranny and uh, oppression during this particular time. That's why the writer of Kings spends so much time on this. If you think about it, just in terms of a uh, large overview. We have 22 chapters in 1 Kings and 25 chapters in 2 Kings, so we have a total of 27 chapters. We have the last six chapters of 1 Kings focus, focuses on the ministry of Elisha, and then 13 chapters into 2 Kings cover the ministry, I mean, Elijah, the last uh, 17 to 22, last six chapters of 1 Kings is on Elijah. And then the first 13 chapters of 2 Kings is on Elisha. So that's uh, roughly 19 chapters That of these 47 chapters. That's just under a half of the material covered in what was originally one book, the book of Kings, that uh, is given to this period of history under the uh, Amrid dynasty in the northern kingdom, the descendants of specifically Ahab and the evil brought into the northern kingdom through Jezebel, the fertility cults, which translates over for us into just basically a materialistic cult, a prosperity cult, uh, the worship of material things and prosperity, 
and then we see all of the discipline that God took the nation through, uh, through droughts, through famine, through economic catastrophe. So the more they sought prosperity and wealth and comfort through the uh, worship of the false gods and goddesses, the more God punished them through famines and droughts. Yet they persisted. That's the nature of spiritual rebellion against God is a persistence in disobedience. And in the midst of this time, as the northern kingdom is basically following a death cult, and the people are worshiping death and following death. And as I pointed out from uh, Moses' uh, parting words to the Israelites before he went up uh, on Mount uh, Pisgah to die, he said, choose today, li-, I said before you today, life or death. Are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? And for the most part, the northern kingdom was choosing death. And so in that context, we have seen these various miracles of Elisha, where he is showing that God is the one who gives life where there is death. God is the one who supplies all that we need for life, even when there may be nothing. We uh, looked at the uh, victory that God gave the uh, uh, n- the alliance between the northern and southern kingdom in the battle against Moab, and how God gave them uh, gave them victory there, although it wasn't a complete victory because God was not going to bless the house of Ahab. In the fourth chapter, he supplied the uh, oil for the widow, that even though uh, she only had a small amount, God multiplied that. Then we saw his raising of the Shunammite uh, woman's son from the dead. He's, God is the one who gives life where there is uh, where there is death. He is the only one who can provide regeneration. This was reinforced in the uh, last two episodes of the fourth chapter where uh, there were the sons of the prophets who were uh, cooking a stew and they put some uh, wild gourds into this this pot of stew and it poisoned the stew. And so uh, Eli- uh, Elisha then had them put some flour, which represented uh, positive fruit bearing of the uh, agriculture of, of the northern kingdom, put some flour into the pot, and then that uh, destroyed the poison, and then they could eat the food. And then there was the provision of the people from, from the uh, 20 loaves of barley bread at the end of the chapter. God is the God who gives life where there is death. Only God can do that. This is the message that is driven, being driven home again and again to the northern kingdom. But now God has another lesson for them and for us because he's going to go out of the... Uh, out of Israel to use a Gentile general, a Gentile enemy general. This would be as if uh, uh, God were going to give a little uh, real-time lesson to us about uh, spirituality and grace by choosing uh, uh, a leader in Al-Qaeda to be the example of his grace. We just uh, would cringe at the thought that God could give grace to someone of that kind of a background. And yet that is what we see here at the very beginning of the fifth chapter. The fifth chapter begins with two verses that give us the setting and the background in a quick summary fashion. And in verse 1 we read, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord, Yahweh, had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So that gives us a little bit of the background, so we need to look at this a little bit to understand all that is implied at the beginning. We have this individual, Naaman. Naaman is called a commander. He is the Sar Sabah of, uh, of the Syrian army. That is a compound word. Sabah is the word that we use in the plural at Sabaot, meaning hosts or armies. Hosts is an antiquated English word that refers to a large army or number of armies. 
that are pulled together. This is in the singular, so it's referring to the army of Syria. And the, it is preceded by the word sar, which refers to his position. Now, sar is a word that means uh, leader or prince. It can mean ruler, uh, chief, chief captain. It's translated captain in the New American Standard Bible, but that could be confusing because in our military ranking, we have uh, one rank in the army that is a captain that is not a field grade rank. And then we have the uh, Navy has the rank of captain, which is equivalent to an army colonel. But this is not a captain of either of those kinds. This is, a, this is the chief commander. And that is how the New King James translates this. The context indicates that he is the commander of the entire army of Syria. So he is the uh, commander-in-chief, the five-star general that is in charge of the army of Syria under the king. Now, as such, he has led numerous uh, raids against Israel. And all through this time that we are studying, we have read about these wars from uh, Ben-Hadad II as he has sent his armies against uh, Ahab and against uh, uh, his sons in the northern kingdom of Israel. So Syria is the arch enemy of the northern kingdom at this time. They have had uh, 30, 40, 50 years of intermittent warfare with Syria. This is the enemy, and this is the commander of the enemy's armies. And he is the one who is in charge of bringing them down. In fact, there's the one incident that is uh, summarized in verse 2 where they brought back captives, one of which is this young girl that has been made a servant, a slave in the household of Naaman. So he is not simply a Gentile. He is a Gentile general who is the commander of the armies who are the, the chief enemy of the northern kingdom and of Israel. So this this guy is not someone that is going to be looked upon with much favor by the uh, either the northern or the southern kingdom. But he is a man of integrity. Now, he is not a believer at this point, but he is a man of a certain level of human integrity. He is said to be great, and honorable, according to the translation of the uh, New King James Version, and the Greek, indica- I mean the Hebrew, rather indicates that he was a man that is uh, had tremendous military accomplishments. That's the idea that he was great, and that he had uh, held a high position in the eyes of his master. He's elevated in the eyes of his master, which means that he is his accomplishments are such that he has earned the respect and the admiration of Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. And so not only did the king respect Naaman, but he personally liked him and depended upon him to carry out all of the military operations that Ben-Hadad had in his mind as he was seeking to expand the territory of uh, Syria and the dominion of Syria, especially over the northern kingdom of Israel. So we see that Naaman is presented as a man of tremendous intellect. He has great talents and abilities. He has been rewarded richly uh, by the king of Syria for his accomplishments, and he is a man of tremendous stature within the uh, culture of, of Syria. But all of this is his, not ultimately not because of who he is or what he has done, although he had been blessed by God with a certain large amount of natural talents and abilities. But the sovereignty of God has seen to it that he has given uh, Naaman victory. And that is because God is using Naaman to bring divine discipline against the southern kingdom of Israel. And that's the uh, significance of that statement uh, in the middle of the first verse, because by him, Yahweh had given victory to Syria. God has 
been behind those victories. He is disciplining the northern kingdom, and that was part of the fourth cycle of discipline that the that the uh, that Israel would be defeated militarily by her enemies. And so God has blessed this man, but that does not mean that he is a believer uh, at this point in any way. And then there's the concluding uh, sentence in the verse, he was also a mighty man of valor. That indicates his personal courage. He had great moral courage and great battlefield courage. He was a warrior. He was one of the top chief warriors in the Syrian uh, military, but he had one major problem, and that is that he is a, or he was a leper. Now, what I want you to notice as we read through and go through this chapter is all the things that emphasize the the greatness of Naaman in terms of his basic uh, human abilities. He has so much. He has wealth. He has success, he has position, he has power, and he can't rely on any of that to solve the problem of his leprosy. Now we have to understand leprosy in terms of how it is talked about in the Scripture. First of all, what it is exactly, and then secondly, in terms of what it signifies, what it represents spiritually in terms of the Mosaic Law. First thing we should understand about leprosy, or what is translated leprosy in the Scripture, it actually represents uh, several different words that are used in Hebrew. The primary word is the uh, Hebrew word sarat, but it is not a reference to what we refer to by the modern term of leprosy, which is also known as Hansen's disease, which is uh, named after the uh, doctor in the late 19th century who discovered that leprosy was caused by a bacteria, the Mycobacterium leprae. And so modern leprosy is not what is referred to in the Bible as uh, leprosy. Uh, For one thing, as a bacteria, uh, modern leprosy would not affect houses and walls, which make up a large part of what the Levitical uh, laws say about dealing with leprosy. If there's leprosy, sarat, on the walls or on the fabrics, then the, the house is unclean or the fabric is unclean. Certain things needed to be handled. Uh, this, what we read in the scripture would more likely fit some sort of mildew or fungus, at least as it applies to walls and, and fabrics. Unfortunately, there's really a lack of detail in the scripture as to what this leprosy, this sarat, uh, described, and so we can't be sure uh, how, uh, just exactly what it was. Now, the central chapters in the New Testament that deal with that deal with leprosy are in Leviticus chapters uh, 13 and 14. You might just stick your finger in your Bible there at 2 Kings 5 and turn back with me to Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. I'll just point out a couple of things to you as we as we get ready to understand what's going on with with um, Naaman. Just as we talk about leaven or yeast as representing sin and sinfulness when, it, when we talk about bread and we talk about unleavened bread and the Lord's table, so this concept of leprosy or sarat in the Old Testament really depicts some sort of uh, contagion that is easily spread and somehow defiles that which it touches, whether it's uh, some sort of skin disease or whether it is something that happens or occurs in a house, whether it's mildew, uh, rot, uh, or s- some sort of fungus, uh, we're not sure. The word may be so general that it really isn't describing one singular disease or problem, but may cover a range of diseases or problems, and so as such, leprosy, like leaven, is a picture of sin and the contagion of sin and the spread of sin. Now, when we read in Leviticus chapter 13, um, 
in the in verses three and four, just to give an idea of how it is described. Uh, if a man comes with a a sword, the verse three says, "The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if the hair on the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore." Now, Hansen's disease does not turn hair white. It it it's a it has to do with the nervous system, and it eats away the the flesh. But the, the hair does not turn white, so there's one area of, of, of distinction. The priest then, if he sees this or examines this, he pronounces the individual unclean. Now, as we go through Le- Leviticus, these words clean and unclean are always used to describe a spiritual condition in relationship to a person's being able to come and worship at the temple. And so the uh, b- being pronounced clean or unclean means that a person who has this kind of a defect is not allowed to come into the temple to worship God. And so as such, it is used as a picture of, of sin that keeps us from coming into the presence of God. Verse 4 goes on to describe another way this might appear as a bright spot. If the bright spot is white on the skin of the body and does not appear to be deeper than the skin and its hair is not turned white, then the priest shall isolate the one who has the sore seven days. And again and again what we'll see is a reference to a seven-day period and or a reference to something else that is done over seven days or seven sacrifices. And the word seven uh, it comes up frequently throughout the description in chapters 13 and 14 because uh, as in relation to the solution because that is a picture of the completed work of God just as God completed his work of creation in 7 days in Genesis chapter 1 so the 7 represents the complete or total work of God emphasizing that it is God who is the one ultimately that uh, provides the cleansing. Now, I don't want to spend the time going through all of the different uh, permutations and examinations that are covered in chapter 13. What I want to do is focus on the solution that is given under the Mosaic Law in chapter 14. So just turn the page, and I'll just hit some of the high points here. And what I want you to be impressed with in these first 32 verses is how complex the solution is for the Jew who needs to come into the temple in order to worship God. It is not something that is simple. We will see that there's this huge contrast between what God required of the person who had a leprous sore under the Mosaic law versus what he what is uh, required of Naaman the Gentile who is not going to be coming into the temple at all in order to to, uh, worship God. So chapter 14 begins, uh, verse 2, this shall be the law of the leopard for the day of his cleansing. I want you to note how many times that word is used as we go through here. Cleansing always relates to the individual being ritually purified or cleansed so that they can come into the temple. So this is a picture, going to be a picture of salvation or a picture of uh, experiential sanctification in order to come into God's presence. This shall be the law of the leopard for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. So the priest has to go outside the camp. He, the, the, because of this, the uh, uh, leprosy, he, the individual is separated. That indicates that we should separate, be separated from sin. The priest shall examine him, and indeed if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. Note the detail. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Notice how detailed this is. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scar and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running 
water, and he shall sprinkle it seven times, indicating once again the fullness of God's work. He shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. The dead bird pictures the fact that there has to be a death for sin, and the living bird represents that that life comes after uh, cleansing takes place. And then, verse 8, he used to be cleansed, shall wash his clothes, shave off all of his hair from head to toe, wash himself in water that he may be clean. Note the word clean again. After that, he shall come into the camp, but he shall stay out of his tent seven days. Notice that seven-day period again. But on the seventh day, he shall shave all the hair off his head. See, it's grown some since he shaved it a week earlier. And his beard and his eyebrows, all his hair he shall shave off. He shall wash his clothes, wash his body in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish, Notice there's always been, already been the sacrifice of the bird. Now he's going to take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, uh, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with uh, oil as a grain offering, and one log of oil. And the priest who makes him clean shall present the man who is to be made clean, and those things for the Lord at the door of the tabernacle. The priest shall take one male lamb offered as a trespass offering. So we have a a uh, grain offering mentioned earlier. Now we have a trespass offering and then a wave offering before the Lord. And then in verse 13, we have the mention of a sin offering and a burn off. All the offerings are involved. This is a massive approach to ritual cleansing that has to take place. Now, I can tell I'm already losing some of you in the mass of ritualistic details here, and I want you to understand why this is happening this way. And that is because the leprosy pictures the total defilement that comes because of sin. And so all of these different sacrifices all represent different aspects of the work of Christ on the cross And that's why the totality of that work has to be applied to the individual in order for them to be cleansed and come into the presence of God. Well, I'll stop there. You have gotten the point by now that if you were Jewish and wanted to go into the temple to worship God that and you had had leprosy, then it was a massive uh, uh, cleansing project involving every offering, every sacrifice, plus a couple of others like the birds, uh, before you could be restored to fellowship within with God and the community, because until that happened, you were outside, outside of the camp. Let's go back to, uh, back to chapter five. What we noted in that is that this leprosy is not the same as modern leprosy. And I want to give you just a couple of other reasons for that. I mentioned that uh, one evidence of that is that the uh, white, the hair turning white is not the same. That is not what occurs in Hansen's disease. Another, a second difference is that the symptoms of Hansen's disease progress very slowly over a period of several years, and yet the descriptions that we have in Leviticus 13 are that this is something that takes place rather quickly. When there's a first sign of it, the individual is to go outside of the camp for seven days, and then at the end of seven days, you can have a proper diagnosis. Well, that's not that's that's rather quick. Hansen's doesn't develop uh, that quickly. Hansen's is curable only through uh, drug therapy, but a person who has the the leprosy spoken of in Leviticus 13 and 14 can recover from it without any uh, necessary uh, drug treatment. Uh, a fourth difference is that Hansen's is a disease that causes the destruction of of, of flesh. Ne- flesh becomes necrotic, and and uh, uh, fingers and toes and are, are fall off and have other various horrible consequences, but this is not characteristic of what the Bible refers to as as leprosy. So when you read about leprosy in the Old Testament, it's not talking about um, it's not talking about what 
is usually referred to uh, as leprosy today. It is some has to do with perhaps a number of different skin diseases, which would include psoriasis, eczema, seborrhea, vitiligo, uh, different things of this nature would all be uh, part of this this disease. So we read now in verse three that there is a solution to Naaman's problem, and this comes from a young Jewish girl that has been brought back as a, as a slave, taken captive in a military campaign. Once again, we see that Israel is the source of blessing for the world. God is uh, mediating blessing through Israel. So she tells her mist- mistress, the wife of Naaman, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria for he would heal him of his leprosy. So somehow she knows of Elisha, and she knows that Elisha could heal him. And when Naaman hears this, he goes to Ben-Hadad, the king, and says, Thus and thus said the girl who's from the land of Israel, if I go down there, they have a prophet who can heal me. And the king, who is his friend and who cares about him, doesn't want to lose his chief commander, sends him down to Israel with a letter uh, to the king of Israel, a letter to uh, command the king of Israel to find the, this prophet to heal uh, Naaman. And so he, goes to, he departs. The latter part of verse 5 says, He departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand uh, shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Now this is uh, quite uh, an amount. He's taking a caravan with him because... Uh, this would equate to, for example, the 6,000 shekels uh, of gold would equate to about 150 pounds of gold. And 150 pounds of gold, remember, gold and silver are measured according to uh, troy weight, which is 12 ounces to uh, to the pound. And if we were to factor that at roughly $1,000 to the, I know it's a little bit above that right now, but we're just going to use round numbers. At $1,000 an ounce, that's about $1.8 million in gold. And the silver would uh, measure out, uh, uh, the, the silver would measure out to the 10 talents of silver, measures out to about 750 pounds of silver. And at $17 an ounce, this would be equivalent to about $150,000 today. So, And then there's the 10 changes of clothing. This was the latest uh, whole couture from uh, Damascus. And so this is the finest of clothing that he is taking with him. And he's going to impress people with how much he can pay in order to be healed. He has... Uh, brought approximately $2 million plus uh, some of the finest uh, clothing that it was available at that, particular, at that particular time. He's operating on a works system that he can pay for the healing. He will learn differently. At the heart of a, any payment process in religion is always arrogance. Arrogance is man's thinking that he can do something to impress God with what he has or what he has acquired or what he brings, uh, brings to the table to barter with God, and somehow he can gain God's approval. So Naaman comes down with all of this uh, wealth with him, and he brings this letter to uh, the king of Israel and says, and the letter said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Now you can just imagine that um, uh, the king of I- Israel is just about to have a heart attack at this point, that his enemy Ben-Hadad expects him to heal his general of his disease. Uh, just skipping over the irony of the whole situation, that he's going to heal his enemy's best general, uh, but he knows that if he doesn't, that uh, he's going to be invaded again. And so he just goes through all of the histrionics of grief, typical of that era. He tears his clothes, and he cries out, Am I God, to, in verse 7, Am I God to kill and make alive? Notice he's learning something from what Elisha has been teaching through these various miracles over the past uh, year, year or two. Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? 
Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks. Look, he's just seeking a quarrel. He's just trying to pick a fight with me by doing this. And then Elisha hears this. He hears of the king tearing his clothes, and he sends a messenger to inquire as to why he's torn his clothes, and uh, tells him, tells the king, send him to me so that, notice the end, this is the point of the whole episode, so that he shall know that there is a prophet, a true prophet in Israel, and thus a true God. So Naaman goes down with his horses and chariot. Notice, again, it's reinforcing his wealth, his power, his position, his prestige, all that he has. He goes down with his horses and his chariots, uh, all of which should impress Elisha, this whoever heard of this prophet living in some uh, clay hovel down in, in the northern kingdom of Israel when you have all of the power and all of the might of the Syrian army and all of the uh, privilege that Naaman has. And so uh, Elisha won't even come out to talk to him. He sends a servant out to talk to him. Elisha is not going to be not at all impressed with Naaman. He's not going to come out and bow down before him, uh, give him any of the things that uh, Naaman thinks he is due because of who he is and what he has done. And so uh, Elisha sends a messenger out, sends his servant out to him and says, here's what you do. You go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Well, Naaman just really gets angry. Have, have you ever been in a situation where you've tried to witness to somebody and just tell them that Jesus is the only way to heaven and all you have to do is trust him and it's that simple and people get mad at you? That, that's what's happening here. He, he wants to do something. He wants to somehow impress God with who he is so that he can be healed. And so he reacts in anger. He is angry at the fact that Elisha won't even, doesn't even come out and talk to him, just sends his servant out. And he is angry because he has to go wash in this muddy little Jewish stream, the Jordan. Now, here's a, here's a map I put up here. The upper part to the upper right is uh, Syria, the area of Aram, or modern Syria. You see Damascus there is located near at that point, it's an intermittent stream of the uh, Abana River. And to the south of that is the Farpar River that flows down from Mount Hermon there, you see, to the left, which is the highest point uh, in is- Israel. It snows there every winter. They have a ski resort up there now on Mount, uh, Mount Hermon. But those are the two rivers that are going to be mentioned here uh, in the text. And Mount Hermon is also the area on the southwestern side where you have the headwaters or some of the headwaters for the Jordan uh, flow, uh, flow down. And so uh, we read in uh, Naaman's reaction, he says, um, in verse 11, Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of of Yahweh his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. See, God didn't do it the way Naaman thought it should be done. God's not under Naaman's control. Verse 12, Naaman goes on to say, Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? See, he's a good Syrian patriot. How can the waters of Israel be any good? Our waters are naturally better up in Syria than this little muddy stream, the Jordan. Why should I go wash there? So he goes away in a rage. He is extremely angry. And that evening, probably a little time went by to let him calm down, blow off some steam. His servants came to him and spoke to him. Now his servants, because they are servants and slaves, they understand humility. And if you don't understand humility, you can never accept grace. Whenever somebody wants to give you a gift and you say, well, no, 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 I, I, don't, I don't really deserve that. You're just being as arrogant as you can be. You don't understand grace orientation. I always remember the story of, uh, when I think of this, of Jim Myers when uh, Jim Myers was uh, down here in Houston sometime in the early 70s, and he was at uh, over at Baraka Church, and they were uh, needed some space. They were moving all the books out of the library. They were going to give them to some pastors who needed them. And a pastor theme uh, told uh, Jim Myers, said, well, go in there and take whatever you want, 
and put it in your library. And Jim went in, and he took a box or two boxes of books with him, and there were probably, you know, 800, 1,000 books in that library. And afterwards, Jim said, you know, I wasn't grace-oriented enough to take the whole lot. (laughs) God's going to give you everything in salvation. Great God, I'll just take this and this and this. I'm not going to exploit your grace and really use everything you've given me. You said that your grace is sufficient for all my problems. Well, I'm only going to utilize it on two problems, and I'll try to solve the rest myself. See, we're arrogant. We don't really want to accept all of this free grace. So that shows that humility must precede the acceptance of the gift. And the servants understand this. So they go to him and they approach him in humility and respect and say, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, you would have done it. If it had been something hard, if it had been something difficult, if you would have had to conquer something, then you would have been glad to do that. But he just asked you to do something rather simple that anybody can do. Anybody can go down to the Jordan and dunk themselves in the Jordan seven times. So you're insulted because he didn't require of you something that you think is of your station and your position. And all that Elisha said was go down, wash, and be clean. Notice the emphasis there, wash and be clean. How many times do we see that, those terms used in the ritual of Israel in terms of uh, representing man's need to be cleansed from sin before he can be saved? And so verse 14 shows that he listens. He has humility. He is teachable. He gets past his anger. He humbles himself, listens to the advice of his servants, and he does what Elisha told him to do. He goes to the Jordan, and he dips seven times, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, all pink and rosy and as, as uh, fresh as it could be. And he was clean. That's, when it says he was clean, it's not talking about the fact that, that, that he's had a good shower or a good bath, and so the dirt's washed off. Clean is a term that relates to man's relationship to God. And so verse 15, he returned to the man of God, he and all of his aides, and came, stood before him, and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. See, he understands God. He, this is, shows that he ha, this is when Naaman is converted and he recognizes and is expressing his devotion to the one true God of Israel. And he wants to express his appreciation, so he wants to give a gift. Now, normally, that's a good thing. Those are free will offerings under the Mosaic Law. It's the basis for uh, Christian giving in the New Testament. But Elijah understands there's a higher issue here, that if he gives a gift, he's gonna, it's going to appear as if somehow there was a barter made, an exchange made, that somehow he paid for the healing. And so Elisha wants to make sure that that is abundantly clear and that there's no money going to be exchanged, that the healing was totally free. And so Elisha's response in verse 16, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And even though Naaman urged him to take it, Elisha refused. So Naaman then says, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but only to Yahweh. What he's going to do with the earth, it's the promised land. He's going to take that back to Syria, and he is going to put that on the ground and have an altar to God on soil that came from Israel. But he knows he's going to have a problem. He knows that he's living in the midst of a pagan culture, and he is the... uh, second highest person in the land, the highest person under the king, and the king is going to require him to do some things that he knows are wrong. And so in verse 18, he addresses this to Elisha. He says, yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant. He's asking for what I sometimes facetiously refer to as prebound. 
he's going to confess his sin ahead of time. Some of you tried that. That doesn't normally work. This is an exceptional situation. He is, he is uh, asking for that he will be forgiven because he knows that in his position... He will be required to go into the idolatrous temple of Ramon to worship there with the king and that he will be required to bow down before the idol. And he knows that will displease God, but that that's going to be required of him in his position. And so he asks for pardon ahead of time and Elisha grants it. This shows something about the grace of God that God recognizes this is not a license to sin, but God recognizes that there are are times perhaps when we are in circumstances where we are not where we might have to do certain things required in a certain position that are not that we know basically isn't what God would want us to do if it were if we were on our own. Now this is not a, a major violation of something, although it is a violation of the Mosaic law, but he's a Gentile. He's not under the Mosaic law. He's not required to follow all of those strict commands related to idolatry as a Jew would be. And so there is a, an extension of grace here because of that particular, uh, his particular circumstance. So Naaman learns about grace. You can't buy it. You can't purchase it. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. But that's not the end of the story because we have an epilogue here with Gehazi, the servant. Gehazi hasn't learned that lesson yet, and Gehazi's got his eye on all that gold and all that silver and says, you know, there ought to be a little something in there for me. I mean, I ought to benefit from this in some way. Look at all that I have done to help my master. And so uh, what what is described in verses 20 through 27 is this episode where Gehazi goes after Naaman, and when he gets to him, just like any good legalist, he's going to come up with a good rationale for why Uh, He ought to get something a little extra, uh, be put into the offering plate in order to take care of things, and uh, he can't just operate on pure grace. And so he makes up this story. He says, Just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So a talent of silver was about 10%. The two changes of garments, he had 10, so that was 20%. So he's asking for a triple tithe. I've heard of some pastors at times asking for their congregations to triple or quadruple a tithe to build a building or something else. This is what he's doing here. He's not relying upon God. He is manipulating the situation. But Naaman is extremely gracious and appreciative of what God has done. So he says, no, 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 I'm not going to give you one talent of silver, I'll give you two, gives him two bags of silver and the garments, and then he goes back to, uh, uh, goes on his way and goes back to Syria. Then when, after that, uh, Gehazi goes back to, uh, uh, goes back and hides what he has taken from Naaman, and he goes to see Elisha, who begins to uh, interrogate him. So where'd you go, Gehazi? Well, he lies again. Your servant didn't go anywhere. And again, Elisha asked, did not my heart go with you? In other words, I know where you were going. I have my sources of information. The Lord revealed it to me. When the man turned back to meet you, he gave you money uh, and clothing. And this is not the time for that. Therefore, consequences to your legalism... Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And Gehazi went out from his, from his presence, leprous as white as snow. So there were immediate consequences uh, transfer that punishment because this is teaching a lesson. And the lesson is God's grace is free. God's grace is free to Gentiles. God's grace is free to Jews. And it is extremely dangerous And sinful, leprosy speaks of sinfulness, sinful to pile legalism on grace to 
create systems where people are required to do something in order to gain the grace of God. And so this is one of those wonderful pictures we have in the Old Testament of the of God's free salvation. Some people have said, well, this concept of free grace, isn't that sort of an oxymoron? Isn't that sort of redundant? Well, it may be, but people, too many people today don't understand what grace is. They think that grace is something that can be earned or bought or traded for. But grace is free. It is a free gift, no strings attached, something that God gives because of who he is and because Jesus Christ paid the penalty in full at the cross, and we can do nothing to gain it, Nothing to earn. It doesn't matter whether we have a high position in society or low position. It doesn't matter how large our bank account is or how empty it might be. Every human being comes to the Lord the same way, in humility accepting everything from God. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study this uh, episode that you have re- recorded in Scripture for our benefit that it gives us a tremendous picture uh, of your grace, the freeness of your grace, and of the totality of your grace. There's nothing, nothing about salvation that is dependent upon who we are, what we've done, how much we've accomplished. It's all dependent upon you. Jesus Christ paid the penalty in full. The certificate of debt was nailed to the, to the cross. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sins. Your sins, your debt was paid for on the cross. Your debt was nailed to the cross. Jesus Christ paid it in full. All that is left is for you to accept that free gift. You do that simply by believing, trusting in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross on your behalf. The instant you believe that Jesus died for you, you're cleansed. You are positionally cleansed of all sin. You are made a new creature in Christ. You are born again. You have the imputation of Christ's perfect righteousness, and you are declared just, and that you are given eternal life, which can never, ever be taken from you. This is your opportunity to accept that gift by believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Now, Father, we pray that you would challenge the rest of us with our understanding of grace, that we may become more grace-oriented, and that we may reflect your grace and your love in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.